It's an honor tonight to have the opportunity to present to you Bruce Gagnon on the subject of about endless war and economic crisis. And he is an international expert on weapons in space. Uh, he, uh, he just returned from demonstrations in South Korea protesting the construction of a huge U.S. Navy base, a new U.S. Navy yeah. base on Jeju-do. However, he is going to talk about the expanding militarism, the economic crisis here at home related, and uh, the Weapons in Space program. He is a member of the National Writers Union, UAW Local 1981, AFL-CIO, and writes a popular blog called Organizing Notes. Uh, the event is co-sponsored by us and the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, the member of which the membership of which has a pretty good overlap. And admission is free. However, voluntary donations will be accepted to support the global network activities. Yeah. Bruce? Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, let me just say a few words about the Global Network, a few more words about it, and then a bit more about myself. Uh, the Global Network is this year uh, having our 20th year of operation. Uh, the Global Network is made up of about 150 affiliated organizations around the world today. As the U.S. Space Command put in place this military space apparatus that orbits the Earth, these satellites have to talk to the ground below them as they pass different parts of the planet. And so the Space Command has built these, what they call downlink bases all over the Earth that talk to the satellites in what they call real time, split second time. And in these countries, England, Greenland, Australia, New Zealand, many other places around the planet, peace activists like you all don't like having these bases in their country and they protest against them and they make up essentially the membership of the global network in addition to groups in this country that are located near military space installations. So we're trying to prevent the arms race from moving into space. The nuclear industry views space as a new market for nuclear-powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars and the asteroids in the years ahead, nuclear rockets to the uh, deeper planets with reactors on board, and the whole weapons in space program to go with it that would be used to benefit corporate globalization here on Earth, but also to control the pathway between the Earth and the outer planets, because they're saying that because of the way we live on Earth, we're going to need six more planets to supply us with resources. That's why they're interested in mining the sky. And the Space Command's other job is to be able to decide who gets on and off the Earth to get at those resources so that the corporations can control this process. And so that's why you saw when Obama became president, one of the first things he did was to begin to privatize some of uh, the NASA operations after you, the taxpayers, paid many years of research and development to create the technologies that now almost make it possible to go out and mine the sky. They're beginning the privatization process. And in fact, there's legislation that they've long ago written that when the day comes that they can successfully mine the sky for profit, they want to introduce legislation to make it tax exempt. So again, you pay, the, you pay the freight all these years, but when the time has come to make the profit, cut out the people. So that's the plan as it exists. I grew up in a military family. My dad was in the Air Force. Uh, we were uh, moving around the world as I was growing up. In 1968, we were living up in the panhandle of Florida. It's so conservative there, they call it Lower Alabama. And I had my first organizing experience at the age of 16. I worked on the Nixon campaign. I was the vice chair of the Okaloosa County, Florida Young Republican Club. 
and I did such a good job of working on that campaign. They had a fish fry fundraiser right before the election, and they asked me to sit at the head table with the speaker that evening. You probably remember this guy, he died a few years ago, Senator Strom Thurmond from South Carolina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's how I got my start. And then from there, it kind of went downhill. <laughs> in 1971, I tried to join the Air Force. This was at the time of the war, the Vietnam War, when most people of good sense were trying to stay out of the military. But I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to be a career man, or a lifer, as we used to call them. And, uh, but I flunked my induction physical. And so I had to get a waiver, actually, to get in. When most people would die for a waiver, you know, just to be able to stay out. And after all my training, I was sent to Travis Air Force Base in California that was an airlift base for the war in Vietnam. And GIs would come from all over the country to get on the planes to go overseas. And when the planes would come back, they would bring the body bags of the dead soldiers. So there was a lot of anti-war activity outside the gate and inside the barracks, too. And as it turned out, the day I checked into the barracks, they looked down this clipboard and the guy said, oh my God, I'm really sorry, man. We've only got one room left. Get your bags, he said, follow me. And we walked down this long, dark hallway, last door on the left, and he, he said about three times, really, man, we'll get you out of there as soon as we can. And I thought it would be a broom closet with a cot. I spent a night or two in there. But he opened the door and we walked in. It was a small room with two beds in it with anti-war posters all over the wall. <laughs> As it turned out, it was the room of one of the leading GI resistant movement organizers in the barracks. And they were trying to kick him out, but they didn't have enough stuff on him yet. So they were keeping him isolated because they didn't want him to infect anyone. <laughs> well, they forgot about me and there I was. And so at night, There'd be a knock on the door, and white guys would come in with chairs and sit in a circle. And they'd talk about the war, and I'm sitting in the corner thinking, these have got to be communists. Mm -hmm. Another night, there was a knock on the door, and black guys came in with chairs. Black Panthers from the cities talking about racism in the military, racism in the country. I'm sitting in the corner thinking, these are definitely communists. <laughs> and then they started smoking marijuana. I had heard of marijuana before, living up behind the barbed wire fences, the Boy Scout that I was, growing up on these military bases, but I had never ever been exposed to it before. And I want to just state with this camera going right here emphatically that I swear to God, in the immortal words of Bill Clinton, I never ever inhaled, not one time. But we've learned a lot about the, the effects of secondhand smoke on innocent bystanders over the years. And I believe that that's what tragically led to my demise because within a few months of being in this room, my chair moved into the circle. I began to uh, partake in all of their political activities and reading their information. And uh, before I knew it, six months into it, I, I decided I was a conscientious objector and I wanted to get out. So I asked to be released. And the first question to me was, well, what's your family history? You come from a, a traditional peace church family, you know, Quaker, Mennonite, Church of the Brethren. And my answer was no. I came from a military family. I was a young Republican for Nixon. And so they turned me down. And I did three and a half years, what I called hard time. Because after I figured out what was going on in the war, it was extremely hard for me to be there and to uh, be a part of all that. But eventually I got out. I went to Florida. And I was going to college at the University of Florida, just ready to graduate when I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union to become an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida. I quit college never to graduate, to become an organizer. That was 1978. I've been one ever since. And in 1983, I began coordinating the newly formed Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice. And we started working on space issues because of the proximity of the Space Center in Florida. And we saw that this thing was getting bigger than a bread box, I like to say. Um, by the uh, late 80s and into the early 90s, and the only other group consistently working on space at that time in the country was in Colorado Springs, where the uh, Air Force Space Command is headquartered today, and Citizens for Peace in Space. 
And so we put our heads together uh, and decided, along with uh, journalism professor Carl Grossman from Long Island, New York, to create the Global Network in 1992. So I've been coordinating that ever since. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about the military-industrial complex as a corporate criminal syndicate. But in order to do that, I have to tell you one more story from my youth. When I was 15, I decided I wanted to be an FBI agent because I wanted to fight organized crime. <laughs> and being the good boy scout that I was, with our motto, be, be prepared, I sent away for an FBI correspondence course for kids, thinking that I'd get a head start on everybody else. And so I learned about fingerprints, that everyone has a distinct fingerprint. And then they also sent along a pamphlet with uh, FBI definitions, one of which I remember still to this day. Modus operandi. M.O. Every criminal has a method of operation. They have a way of repeating themselves, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And so that's what I want to begin with. And to do that, we have to go back to the Civil War, when the weapons corporations were making pretty good money in this country off both sides of the street, even making guns sometimes that didn't fire on the battlefield, but they didn't care because they were making a lot of money. But after the Civil War was over, they noticed, as you can imagine, a drying up in their funding. Although they did still have the Indian Wars out west, but they were even winding down too. The army was chasing down the last of the Comanches in Texas, and in the Dakotas and even further out west, they were pretty much bringing people onto the reservation. But by 1877, in the Dakotas, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull were still on the, on the loose. Their bands were but they were starving to death because as gold was discovered in the Black Hills and the army was sent in to clear the pathway for the miners and the settlers to move into that region, they were killing off the game that the people relied upon. Plus the army had created new high-powered rifles that they were using from the trains that were going across the plains shooting the buffalo, really a policy of extermination of a culture because the buffalo that provided the people with their food, their clothing, everything that they used to live were now destroyed, laying to rot and, and die there on the uh, plains. And so the people literally were starving. So against their better judgment, they agreed to come on to the reservation themselves, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and their s small bands. And the deal was that they would be taken care of by the federal government as long as the grass grew green, but they had to give up their guns and their horses, essentially their entire way of life. But as it turned out, the corporations that were contracted with by the government to provide them with all of their provisions uh, were cheating them as well. They were skimming. And so they were giving them blankets that were so thin and so poorly made that by the end of the winter they had holes in them and the people were freezing. The bacon was rancid, the flour had bugs in it, so even on the reservation, the people were starving. But that wasn't enough for these corporations. They were so greedy that even that skimming of, of the profit wasn't enough. And so they put together a public relations team that they used to fabricate a story. They brought in artists who did renderings of Crazy Horse back on the warpath, killing settlers, raping white women, killing children. And they brought in journalists who wrote and fabricated and wrote these stories, and they planted them in all the major newspapers around the country. Well, of course, the American people were outraged. They thought that the Indian Wars had been, you know, uh, c come to an end, that the savages were brought onto the reservations, and now they learn this. They demanded that Congress do something about it. And of course, Congress was only too willing to swing into action immediately and appropriate more money for the Indian Wars, when in fact, Crazy Horse was sitting in his teepee on the reservation with not a horse or a gun to his name. And then fast forward to 1973 when I'm in the Air Force. One day I go to the base exchange during my lunch hour and I'm looking at the book, book rack and there is this thick book called the Pentagon Papers that thank God Daniel Ellsberg, a Marine uh, captain, been to Vietnam, now working at the RAND Corporation, helping to write the government's secret history about how it fabricated 
the pretext in order to sell the war in Vietnam to the American people, the media, and the Congress. And so I start reading it. 7,000 pages this, this book, this uh, document uh, was. Ellsberg, as, as he was helping to put this together, put this secret history together, his conscience was bothering him. He smuggled it out in pieces at night from the Rand Corporation, took it to a local copy shop, and in those days, you remember the copy machines were very slow. It would take forever for it to go across and just make one copy. And he was worried that at any moment, some FBI agent like that Bruce Gagnon, for example, would come busting through the door and arrest him and put him in jail, and he'd never, ever get these uh, Pentagon papers out to the public, but he succeeded in doing so with the help of people like Howard Zinn who hid them uh, copies of the of the uh, uh, of the Pentagon Papers in his house there in Cambridge or Boston, wherever he was living at the time. So anyway, uh, I'm reading this while I'm in the service and this destroyed what few remaining illusions I had left about my country, about how they would lie repeatedly in order to sell a war. And then 2003, we saw the same MO again with shock and awe in Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. And of course, we know that was a lie. And then today we see they're at it again still with Iran, saying that Iran is going to launch nuclear weapons at Israel or even us, when in fact Secretary of War Leon Panetta, that good liberal former Democratic congressman from California, has acknowledged on national media that in fact Iran has no nuclear weapons today, nor does Iran have uh, missiles, missiles capable of carrying warheads uh, to the United States of America. So pure fabrication all the way around. The criminal syndicate in operation over a period of time. Well, I live in Bath, Maine, in the mid coast where Navy Aegis destroyers are being built, outfitted with these so-called missile defense systems at a place called Bath Iron Works that is owned by the General Dynamics Corporation. Bath Iron Works uh, builds these missile defense, uh, these ships with these missile defense systems that today are being used to surround Russia and China. When George W. Bush was president, he had one version of this missile defense that he was going to deploy in Poland and the Czech Republic. But when Obama came into office, he rejected that, uh, that program. And some people cheered. In fact, some people called me and said, Bruce, why aren't you cheering? And I said, watch the magician's other hand. And soon thereafter, Obama announced that he was going to deploy a different version of missile defense. In fact, ground based interceptors going into Poland and Urania, Romania, missile defense radars in Turkey. Obama's negotiating with Georgia to put them on Russia's southern border. At the same time, the Obama administration is sending these Aegis destroyers into the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Mediterranean Seas, beginning this encirclement of Russia. At the same time, NATO is expanding eastward violating promises made to the former Soviet Union, to Mikhail Gorbachev at the time of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. You might remember former Secretary of State Jim Baker promised Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not expand one centimeter into the old Warsaw Pact, the Soviet bloc. But when Clinton became president, he began to violate that promise, and ever since NATO's been on steroids, closing in now even into Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, building bases there on Russia's border. Of course, Russia's freaking out as they see NATO and the U.S. surrounding them. You might remember that soon after Obama became president, he went to Prague in the Czech Republic, where he announced a reset of relationships with Russia, and he said he wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. Well, they did negotiate a very modest New START treaty, very modest reductions in nuclear weapons. Soon thereafter, Russia is now saying they're going to have to pull out of that treaty because of this encirclement of them. Why, why would the United States 
want to be surrounding Russia today? Why do we want to restart the Cold War? It makes no sense, does it? Could it be because Russia today has the world's largest supply of natural gas and significant supplies of oil? And don't we know by now that the Pentagon's primary job in the world is to serve as the resource extraction service for corporate globalization? At the same time, these Navy Aegis warships with missile defense systems on board are being deployed in Japan, South Korea, Australia, Guam. Obama is now negotiating with Vietnam, Singapore, and other countries in the region to let these ships port there as well, Philippines and others. And now on top of that, the U.S. is twisting the arm of the South Korean government forcing them to build a Navy base on Little Jeju Island that you heard is just off the coast of the Korean Peninsula. Jeju Island sits 300 miles from the coast of China. And on the south side of Jeju Island is Gangjon Village, 450-year-old fishing and farming village of about 1,200 people. Just offshore, UNESCO recognized soft coral reefs full of tropical beautiful fish going to be destroyed as they dredge the seabed to make it deeper to bring in u.s aircraft carriers nuclear submarines and navy aegis destroyers sacred gurumbi rock the rocky coastline where the people have worshipped nature for 450 years where they worship the passing of their relatives in all that time is today being dynamited by the Samsung Corporation, the lead contractor to build the Navy base. It's going to be covered in cement after that to build the piers and the wharfs to port these U.S. ships. The villagers invited the Global Network to come and hold our 20th uh, annual meeting there. Every year we go to a different country for our annual meeting to try to shine a light on various manifestation of all this space technology war game. We went there in February. We brought people from 13 countries. <coughs> and the first place they took us was to the 4.3 Museum. Now, what is that? 4.3, April 3rd, 1948. You might know that for many, many years, more than 40 years, the Japanese imperialist fascists occupied Korea brutally, mm -hmm. brutally. And after J Japan was defeated in World War II, the U.S. took over Korea. And who did the United States put in charge of Korea? The former Koreans who collaborated with the Japanese fascists. We put them in power. Now, how did the country react? Well, it went up in arms. And this is ultimately what led to the Civil War, the Korean War. And to this very day, that war is not over. There's never been a peace treaty signed. There's a truce, but the war is still officially on. Well, on Jeju Island, because the people were isolated, they were very independent. And they didn't like this situation that the U.S. put these collaborators, these hated collaborators, in charge of their country. It began a whole lineage of right-wing authoritarian dictatorships that today still remain. The President Lee of Korea is a corporate uh, stooge and a lackey and a hack. Well, anyway, the people rose up on Jeju Island, and so the U.S. military sent in this new horrible government with its military forces to bring these people under control. And on April 3rd, 1948, they began a massacre that lasted over about two years and killed more than 30,000 people on Jeju Island. One out of every nine residents on the island were killed. Well, this left a huge scar, as you can imagine, on Jeju Island and in the country at large. And just a few years ago, trying to kind of finally heal that wound, the country declared Jeju Island as the peace island. So it's a bit ironic today that the Peace Island is now having a Navy base built for the U.S. military. The way the U.S. is dealing with its 
massive, massively expensive empire today is to get other countries to come on side to help pay for our bases. And so this is what's happening on Jeju. Well, on our second to last day we were there, the people wanted us to see Gurumbi Rock, but you can't just walk out to it. Uh, Samsung has built a huge fence, as you can imagine, around the perimeter of the base. And on the rocky coast, there's now razor wire. So the people took us out in kayaks, having to row us out there one after the other. And they brought us out there. Uh, Catholic priests and nuns were there with us. They held a mass. Catholic priests and nuns are coming from all over Korea to support them, going to jail frequently. And 16 of us that day crawled under the razor wire and were arrested and taken to jail. These are the most fierce uh, nonviolent activists I've ever seen in all my years, in all my travels, anywhere. These are the most fiercely uh, determined people I've ever seen. And so when I came back, I was determined that more people needed to know about this situation and that more people needed to go there. So I contacted Veterans for Peace and found two people, uh, Elliot Adams, the former president, and Tarek Koff, a leader as well in the organization, and asked them if they would go, and they said yes they would, if I could raise the money. I sent an email out to my list asking for money to send these two guys, and then within a couple days I raised enough money to send six people. And so we found another one, a third person, a guy from Portland, some of you might know, know Mike Hasty also a VFP member. So the three of them went, uh, two of them on one plane, uh, Mike on a separate plane. And when they all got there, they were apprehended immediately. In the case of two of the guys, uh, the authorities had their picture on a piece of paper waiting for them, and they sent them home. The only thing they told them is, you're not welcome in Korea. But I was still even more determined after that. We found another member of Veterans for Peace, Mike Jacobson from Bellingham. And we got a little more creative in terms of how we got him there. And he just returned about four or five days ago after three weeks in the village. So we were really happy that, that he was able to get there. And we're still trying to send more people as well. Why is Jeju so important to the US? Well, Obama recently announced, you might have heard, a pivot of US foreign and military policy into the Asia Pacific region. And because of that, we need more bases and more ports of call for our military, as it's now going to double in the region. Obama recently went to Australia, where he announced a deal with that country to send 2,500 U.S. Marines to northern Australia, to the city of Darwin. I don't know if you all had heard. <clears throat> I hadn't heard, but I guess Australia now fears that they're going to be invaded soon by someone I'm not sure who, and so we had to send in the U.S. Marines to protect them. Well, as it turns out, China imports 60% of its oil on ships. And if you look at a map, you see the Korean Peninsula, you see Jeju, over here is China. And so this seaway here is called the Yellow Sea. And so China imports its oil on ships through the Yellow Sea. Well, as it turns out, Jeju really sits essentially at the mouth of, or I like to call the front gate of the Yellow Sea. A great location if you were going to try to choke off China's importation of oil and other resources it uses to fuel its economy. So I believe that this is what's happening. The U.S. is determined that it can't compete with China economically anymore, but if we can control their access to resources, we will hold the keys to their economic engine. In addition, the U.S. Space Command has been annually wargaming a first strike attack on China every year for the past few years, set in the year 2016. They call it the red team versus the blue team. And this is what happens. China today has about 20 nuclear missiles that are capable of hitting the west coast of the United States. And in this computer war game, the U.S. launches a first strike. The weapon that is used first is the successor to the shuttle. You, you heard the shuttle is being retired. The military space plane, now under development, would fly down from orbit, drop a devastating attack on China's nuclear forces using conventional and or nuclear weapons, 
and then other weapon systems would follow, trying to take out China's 20 nuclear weapons capable of hitting the west coast of the United States. But in the war game, China inevitably gets a few of them launched in a retaliatory strike. A few of them are s survive. They launch them in a retaliatory strike. And it is at that point that these so-called missile defense systems that are being deployed on land and on sea surrounding China's coastal region come into play. Their job, take out the remaining Chinese nuclear forces giving the U.S. a quote-unquote successful first strike attack. So after the first strike sword lunges into the heart of China or Russia, the missile defense system's job is to take out the retaliatory capability. That's why Russia says we got to pull out of the New START Treaty because it's a bad mistake on our part to reduce our nuclear weapons at a time when you're developing the capability to take out our nuclear retaliatory force after first strike. China is saying, gee, our 20 nuclear weapons are exposed, so they're buying submarines from Russia, taking their nuclear weapons off the land, putting them on ships so they're more survivable, and guess what? In Maine, the politicians are saying, oh my God, oh my God, the Chinese are building up their neighbor, their, their, um, the, their naval forces. They're trying to take over uh, the Asia Pacific region. We've got to build more Navy Aegis destroyers at Bath Ironworks built by General Dynamics Corporation. And so off we go to a new arms race and the military industrial complex is thrilled. Just prior to the 2008 election, an old friend of mine in, uh, in a nearby town in Maine, a guy by the name of Herschel Sternlieb, asked me if I'd ever heard of the Crown family in Chicago. I said, no, I've never heard of it. And he said, go home and Google it. Crown, C-R-O-W-N. So when I got home, I did. And I discovered at the time of the election in 2008, the Crown family were the majority stockholders in the General Dynamics Corporation that owns Bath Ironworks. As it turns out, the Crown family collectively gave Obama $500,000 for his campaign that year. And in fact, they also raised money for him within the military industrial complex before that election. In addition, they're a Jewish family and they raise money for Obama within the national Jewish community. Well, after the election was over and Obama had won, Aviation Week and Space Technology magazine reported that Obama got more campaign donations from the military industrial complex than the war hawk Republican conservative John McCain did that year in 2008. And then remember what I said earlier, since Obama became president, he said we're not going to deploy Bush's version of missile defense, which was a generally a Lockheed Martin Boeing program, and instead we're going to move forward with more concentration, more focus on the Aegis destroyers made by General Dynamics. Well, as it turned out, the standard destroyer that was built over the past many years, called the DDG-51, the average cost of it was $1.5 billion. But the new latest version, a story came out in the Associated Press a week ago saying this new destroyer, has not they haven't built any of them yet, just coming online, they're just starting work on it at Bath Iron Works. It's called the DDG-1000, fancy dancy new version with all the high tech stuff you can imagine. The cost of this ship, still to be determined, will range between four and seven billion dollars each. In fact, the Navy didn't want to build it because they said it would be too expensive, but when Obama became president, he instructed the Navy to go ahead with the program as it, anyway, no matter the cost. So I believe that Obama is paying back General Dynamics for helping make him President of the United States of America. Well, the Pentagon's been saying for some time that under corporate globalization of the world economy, every country will have a different job, a different role. We're not going to make things in America anymore. We're not going to have regular jobs in America anymore. We're not going to make shoes. We're not going to make clothes. We're not going to make chairs. We're not going to make electronics. We're not going to make even really that many cars. 
Our job will be security export. And so it's no coincidence that about two years ago, I heard a rumor that Sears had come out with a new line of kids' clothes. Any of you hear that? Well, a friend and I went to the Sears store in the next town, and we went in there, and there, there, they, there they were in the little boys' section, a new line of kids' clothes, military uniforms, camouflage. Now remember, Sears is not a rich people's store. It's a working class, lower middle class people's kind of store. And the message to the young men uh, of America, young boys of America, I should say, is what? This is all you're going to be. This is going to be your role in the coming period under corporate globalization. Recently, the Pentagon created a new command. You all know about this, Africa Command or AFRICOM. And I saw on C-SPAN about two years ago or so, uh, the general in charge of all the National Guards, the man in charge of the 50 state National Guards at the Pentagon, was making a presentation about Africa Command. And he had this big map of the African continent. And he was saying that we're now assigning every one of the 50 states National Guards to a different country on the African continent. And what we're going to do is set up these lily pad interventionary bases, these quick interventionary bases in each of these countries so that we can quickly intervene and put down basically any opposition to corporate globalization, right? Except they call it terrorism. Anyone that stands up to corporate globalization, you're considered a terrorist. And already we've seen the application of this new strategy just recently when the U.S. and NATO attacked Libya. Libya has the largest supply of oil on the African continent. And so in an operation sold to even many quote-unquote liberals, even many quote-unquote progressives, as a good thing because we were liberating the people and we're getting rid of Gaddafi and all that, some people still fall for that bait after all these years, U.S. and NATO going in one more time resource extraction service of corporate globalization this is our job in the coming period but take heart okay. <laughs> <laughs> we promise, promise. take heart take heart yeah. they have a problem every plan for empire, every plan for full spectrum dominance, as they call it at the Space Command, has an Achilles heel. And so what's the Achilles heel? Money. In an industry publication, Space News, a few years ago, they said, look, in an editorial, they wrote an editorial and they said, look, we've got to be responsible corporate citizens and we've got to come up with a funding source to pay for everything space. Some years ago, some years ago, the aerospace industry said that this generic Star Wars, what we call Star Wars, will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth. Space technology today coordinates all warfare on the Earth below. It's what they call net-centric warfare. When the U.S. launched the shock and awe invasion of Iraq in 2003, set in the initial attack, 70% of the weapons were guided to their targets by military space satellites. Today, when the drones fly over Afghanistan and Pakistan, they're hooked up through the satellites all the way back to the U.S. to bases like Creech Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas, where pi so-called pilots are sitting in front of the, their screens looking at the ground because they're hooked up in real time, split-second time, to the satellite and then on to the drone which has a camera on board. The guy sitting there with his joystick, is it Taliban? Is it Al-Qaeda? Is it a funeral? Is it a wedding? And he, in real time he can hit the button, the signal goes to the satellite, to the drone, they, they launch the Hellfire missile, it hits the ground, more civilians dead. All warfare on the earth today coordinated 
by military space technology. So the Space News says, we've got to be responsible corporate citizens. We've got to come up with a dedicated funding source to pay for this. And they said in the editorial, we have. And we're now sending our lobbyists to Washington to secure that funding source. And they said, it is the entitlement programs that officially in America are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the welfare program after Bill Clinton got finished with it. These are the programs that the military industrial complex has targeted for defunding in order to pay for becoming the military arm of corporate globalization. And our job will be increasingly <coughs> militarism. And our country and our culture will increasingly become militarized. And our local economies will increasingly become militarized. Two examples. Colorado Springs, where the Air Force Space Command is headquartered. Fort Carson <coughs> Army Base is located that is now metastasizing like a cancer into southern Colorado because of all these high-tech weapon systems. They need more land, and so now the Army is trying to gobble up all the ranch lands. And so these formerly right-wing, conservative, patriotic cattle ranchers are now mobilizing against the U.S. Army, trying to stop them from gobbling up their lands. And a whole slew of weapons contractors in Colorado Springs service this whole militarization that exists in that community. 50% of the local economy connected to Pentagon spending. Huntsville, Alabama. They call it the Pentagon of the South, where the Army Space Command is located and NASA's Redstone Arsenal. Also, again, a slew of these weapons contractors across the community. Nearly 75% of the local economy connected to Pentagon spending. Albuquerque, New Mexico, University of New Mexico, because of state fiscal crisis, increasingly public institutions are running out of money, they're turning to the Pentagon for funding for computer science departments, engineering, mathematics, astronomy, and on down the line. And now at the University of New Mexico, a public state institution, they have top secret parts of the campus that are run by the military industrial complex in cooperation with the university. The militarization of our culture so that we can perform security export for corporate globalization. So how will we literally ever end America's addiction to war and violence as long as our communities are dependent on Pentagon spending. Now the peace movement is always saying no, right? No war in Iraq, no blood for oil, no attack on Iran, and of course we have to say those things. But what is our yes? What is our alternative, transformative vision? What is our unifying program to bring together our Separate, separated and are dysfunctional and disunified and demobilized progressive community that is scattered apart. What is our unifying program to bring our friends in labor, our friends in the environmental groups who say they want to stop climate change but they haven't been willing to talk about the biggest polluter on the planet which is called the Pentagon, which has the largest carbon footprint on, of the entire you know, planet, of any other institution on the entire planet. So how do we bring together labor and the environmental community and the peace community and the social justice community and other elements of the progressive community? How do we do it? Well, I think it's a very simple four-letter word. J-O-B-S. The American people are job scared, job worried, job freaking out. The politicians are promising jobs. But how are we really going to create jobs in America when the corporations are moving jobs overseas by the 
millions and maybe even zillions like rats off a sinking ship so they can maximize profits internationally, go for cheap labor. How are we really going to create jobs back at home? Where is the investment money going to come from to do that? Who's going to put up the money to create this alternative, transformative, unifying vision back here at home? Occupy the workplaces. 99% to the 1%. Well, let me throw this one out there, see how it fits. The University of Massachusetts at Amherst Economics Department did a study in December 2011 entitled The U.S. Employment Effects of Military and Domestic Spending Priorities. And they looked at $1 billion in military spending. And what they found was, yes, it's true. You spend a billion dollars on military production, okay, we acknowledge it. You create 8,600 jobs, it's true, per billion dollars, 8,600. But they said, you take that same billion, you give tax cuts, you create 10,800 jobs. You put it into home weatherization, something we really need in Maine where I live. We have the oldest housing stock in the country. Our house. I live in an intentional community, 15-room house, built in the late 1700s. It's got a lot of leaks in it. We had an energy audit last year, and they found the equivalent of a four-foot hole in our house that we were generously using to heat the entire neighborhood. <laughs> and so, at great expense, we had our house weatherized, but increasingly the state and the federal weatherization programs are being defunded. And so many people in our state and in other states in the north where it's really cold and where they really need to weatherize, there's no money available. But if we were to take a billion dollars from military and put it into home weatherization, we'd create 12,000 jobs per billion. We put it into health care, 12,300 jobs. We put it into education, hold on to your hat, 19,100 jobs per billion dollars. And my favorite? If we built a national rail system connecting every corner of America, getting us out of our gas-guzzling cars so we don't have to go to war endlessly for oil, so that we can, in a, even in a small, small way, begin to solve for the coming reality and ravages of climate change, we would create 19,675 jobs per billion dollars. Now, all, all along this trip, I've been taking a poll, and I want to see how you match up with your peers. So we're going to have a little show of hands. Those of you in favor of taking a billion dollars of your money and putting it into military production for endless war, creating 8,600 jobs, please raise your hand high. Those of you in favor of building a national rail system, connecting every corner of the country, getting us out of our gas-guzzling cars. My son yesterday told me that he wrote a policy paper for debate called Ban the Cars. And I was so happy. I thought it was so good. <laughs> Build the rail. Ban the cars. Creating 19,675 jobs. Please raise your hand if you would prefer to see that. Well, uh, you guys are all right. You're all right. So why, why can't that be our demand? Why can't that be our unifying, positive message that brings our movements together? Something that benefits labor, more jobs. Benefits the environmental community, obvious. Benefits the peace community, obvious. Benefits the social justice community. Spreads out the wealth. Spreads out the income. Helps people have, you know, better education, health care, all the way down the line. It's a win, 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 all the way down the line. Why the hell aren't we doing it? Well, I want to read a paragraph to you from this brand new book, Mil The Military Industrial Complex at 50, edited by David Swanson. It's from a conference last fall in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I was a speaker amongst many others. All the speeches are in this book. My partner, Mary Beth Sullivan, was a speaker there. She's become kind of an expert on economic conversion of the military-industrial complex. And she, <clears throat> in this article, 
talks about Seymour Melman, the father of economic conversion, former Columbia University economics professor, died a few years ago. There's a great story about Seymour Melman. 1968, Columbia uh, University student occupations of the administration buildings, all that kind of thing. And Seymour Melman wants to hook up with the students, you know, and so he climbs through one of the windows and goes in there with them. He's trying to, you know, show his support. They were like, get out of here. So he climbed back out the window and <laughs> dejected. But he still lives, he still lives. This is what she says. In one of Melman's last articles at the dawn of the 21st century, his frustration was palpable. He noted that New York City put out a request for proposal to spend about three or four billion dollars to replace a number of subway cars. Not a single U.S. company bid on the proposal, in part because the U.S. no longer had the tools it needed to build its subway trains. In this article titled, In the Grip of a Permanent War Economy, Melman calculated that if this manufacturing work were done in the U.S., it would have generated directly or indirectly about 32,000 jobs. Well, you know, there was once another time in American history where we had a dark, evil economic system and that many people during those years believed this system could never be stopped, could never be dismantled, could never be taken down. And in fact, many of the politicians and many of the religious leaders and many of the media people all stood in support of this dark, evil, uh, evil economic system. Well, today, here we are, chained and shackled to this dark, evil economic system called the military-industrial complex. And many people in this country today despair over it, and they feel a sense of hopelessness about it and desperation and utter depression about its dirty deeds, what it's doing around the world to the people of this planet, places like Jeju Island and others as well. Many people think there's nothing we can do about it. But one of the great abolitionists during that other time, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So friends, again, what is our demand today? And why are we not making it in unison with our friends in these other movements day after day after day after day until we are successful in bringing about this change that can literally take this corporate criminal syndicate down to its very knees? I believe one of the reasons why we're not doing it is because our organizing model that we use today is called the business model. I realized it when my son was young and I went to pick him up at a daycare center and all the kids were sitting on the floor stuffing toys under their legs because they had learned even at that young, young age about scarcity. Every person for themselves dog-eat-dog -dog culture. No sharing, no cooperation, no collaboration. And so, is it any wonder that even in our movements, we see each other as competitors often, as much as anything else? We work on a very singular focus, and never the twain shall we meet, as we try to keep our issue really locked in on just our thing, and we hold guard very closely to our, ourselves, our, our donor lists, even our media contacts. God knows that somebody else might get an article in the paper about their group before us. And even our volunteers. And so we're isolated from one another. At the time when the corporate entities that control our country, that control our democracy, and today are drowning our democracy, they understand how things work. And that's why they have interlocking boards of directorates where they coordinate strategy and coordinate everything they do between the banking institutions and the media and the oil companies 
and the weapons corporations and the pharmaceuticals and on down the line. They understand cooperation and collaboration. And we, though, have swallowed the bait. And that's why we're getting our asses kicked today. But thank God, thank God, for the birth of the Occupy movement that has begun in a very hopeful way to begin to help people begin to see that we must begin to make these connections about this corporate domination and how it affects each other and how it affects so many of these other issues. A great hopeful start. Some communities doing it better than others, but by and large, a good, good start. Helping the American people to see the pyramid that at the top, the 1%, controlling those of us along the bottom, the 99%. But people are beginning to understand physics, that in fact the base of the pyramid is stronger than the top of the pyramid. The 99% when they're together and holding hands and working in cooperation and collaboration are actually stronger and mightier than the 1% at that very weak link at the top. But if I can give some constructive criticism to the Occupy movement, still not making the connection to the Pentagon and to the military industrial complex. Talking about the biggest polluter on the planet, the biggest carbon footprint on the planet, and most importantly of all, the military arm of corporate globalization. How the military is used in this country and around the world to control everything and particularly the declining resources in the coming years the oil the natural gas the water the minerals under the ground in africa that are used to make cell phones and computers etc 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 can the occupy movement begin to even connect that dot and if we do and we all begin to advance that larger vision and that stronger articulation, I believe the conscious, consciousness of the American people will rise in a quicker way and we'll be able to move forward faster. I want to share one story about Africa. I recently saw a video of this black African farmer going to work on his land and this American white guy in a suit is standing there as he arrives into his field in the morning and the American tells him to get out of here. We own this now. We bought this land. The corporations are now buying up land all over Africa. And this man was told to leave. And he said, well, my family's been here forever. This is our where we farm, how we feed ourselves. Get out of here or you will be arrested. These corporations are buying up the ground because of what lies under it, or runs through it. This is the reality of corporate globalization. And again, this is how the military will be used to benefit this corporate globalization. Our Mother Earth is taken a pounding today by the U.S. military and its NATO allies. Her body is thrashing about wildly as she's in toxic shock. And the future generations are crying out to all of us, begging, begging us to t take a trip to the Wizard of Oz so that we can get more courage to stand up and defend them, our children and our grandchildren and those that come after them. I want to leave you with this question. And I want you to think about it as the days ahead and maybe ask others about it. What is the number one job of a human being today? What's our job on this planet? Soldiers speak out We can tell the truth of what we see We are not liars Soldiers speak out We have a duty to all children And to their future